Uh, good, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Yes, I'm John August. I'm involved with the Pirate Party, uh, currently treasurer, have been a different office bearer at times past. I've stood for election multiple times. I've been on community radio. If you're in Sydney, I do Speaker's Corner in the domain in front of the art gallery on the third Sunday of the month, sort of different around and weather permitting. Um, but yes, I've been very interested in science, intellectual property, um, a lot of issues. But for the moment, you know, things around foreign policy have condensed a bit. So I guess, um, so I'll, I'll start now, I suppose. So I'm going to talk in a meandering sort of way on foreign policy. Now it's meandering, but equally there's a lot going on with foreign policy. Now let's start with Australia. While you might think we're principled, look after each other and are good to our neighbours, foreign policy tells a very different story. We've done the dirty on Timor-Leste, spying on them with the ongoing debacle around Witness K and Bernard Kaleri. While we owe East Timor from World War II, we take the US debt a lot more seriously. Go back far enough, you had the India, Indonesian mass killings. And if you've seen the movie, The Act of Killing, that sort of bears on that. Now, foreign policy is one of the last vestiges of royal prerogative, where our government has licensed to be an arsehole, to behave like a bully behind closed doors, while in public it's selling Australian values. It comes mostly from vested financial interests, as with resources and Timor-Leste, or focusing on supposed economic gains at the expense of everything else, or we're kowtowing to the US. Now, to be fair, there's a little bit of principled foreign policy in the mix as well, but it really is quite small. Now, there's lots of injustice in the world, but we focus on particular nations for reasons separate to the actual injustice. And we even have selective humanitarian intervention. It might be vested financial interests or it might be cozying up to the US. Now, I appreciate that a big current issue is the Israel-Gaza conflict. I'll observe that, you, that the ICC made a case against both Israel and Hamas and that you can criticise Israel without being anti-Semitic. But there's a bigger story here and I don't want to get drawn into that rabbit hole, uh, just briefly mentioning it so that at least I'm not ignoring it. Now, while the US wants a rules-based order, the US has long thumbed its nose at the International Criminal Court. The US wants a rules-based order, but only if they're the ones making the rules. The WikiLeaks cables actually describe how the US subverts international trade, and it leans on international intellectual property laws, amongst other things, to support its own corporations. Then there's Julian Assange. We've long supported Mr. Assange, a whistleblower who's been targeted by the US. Um, but our government will certainly support Australians in trouble overseas when it's politically convenient and it doesn't actually annoy our allies. Our past foreign minister claimed Mr. Assange would be subject to due process in UK courts, ignoring that it was due process in the application of unjust laws. And our current government has been dragging its heels because I guess it's just too uncomfortable and awkward. Then there's China. Now, during the Hong Kong crisis, John Howard described the Hong Kong demonstrators as inspirational, forgetting that when half a million Australians took part in demonstrations against his involvement in the Iraq war, he said they were giving comfort to Saddam Hussein. In reply, the opposition said he was questioning the loyalty of Australian citizens. Now, China's worth criticising how they've dealt with Hong Kong and the Uyghurs, but that's different to them being a military threat. Supposedly challenging China means you're automatically pro-US and vice versa. But I think that we can all actually think about more than one thing at a time. The US has been projecting soft power into Australia, infiltrating our institutions, and China's done that as well. But in, par in comparison, they've been, well, the bull in the uh, China shop. But anyway, I'll move on from there. China's endured colonial bullying during the century of humiliation, and Chinese philosophy is quite impressive. But as China's power has grown, it started to do what everybody else with power has done, flex its muscles, abuse logic, try to prove falsehoods by strong assertion and blame foreign provocateurs when people have good reason to protest. While there's a point in scrutinising China, Australia's approach was mostly the result of being goaded by the US rather than having our own position. Remember how the US goaded our previous government into suggesting a review into the origins of COVID. Now, speaking of Saddam Hussein, while we originally refused refugees, half a year later we invaded, 
Iraq had suddenly changed so much. While Howard wanted UN inspectors looking into Hussein's palaces, he didn't want UN inspectors looking into his own refugee camps, the ones we had in Australia. Saddam's was certainly a vicious regime, but we can wonder whether it actually improved the situation for Iraqis, blundering in, whether blundering in was the best thing to do. Not to mention the weapons of mass destruction that we found. Well, no, we didn't, did we? More often concerned about human rights is a justification, not the reason. But in closing, foreign policy is a way of being an arsehole, of abusing the truth, of flexing your muscles, all while beating your chest to claim credibility. That's true regardless, be it China or the US or Australia. In criticising China, it does, this does not mean that we thereby endorse the US or even our own foreign policy, nor should we deny our own hypocrisies. Surely we can escape black and white thinking. Thank you.